Um, thank you so much for tuning in to part two of our panel discussion, highlighting and uplifting the story of Pleasant Litchford. My name is JP Dorval and I am one of nine members on UA's Community Relations Committee. The committee's chair, Floyd Akins, did a great job summarizing the background and vision of the committee in part one, so I won't go into that, but I encourage all of you watching this morning to participate in our meetings scheduled on the third Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Part two of this discussion that we have titled New Growth will be focused on discussing how we, the UA community, will take care of the history of Pleasant Litchford and steward his legacy. As a young black man in today's climate who is relatively new to this community, conversations such as this one is refreshing and empowering. To see the effort put into this by the schools, the city, and the planning committee, to see the dedication of the authors to make sure the story is shared, to see the inclusion of descendants of Pleasant Litchford and local historians you know, get looped in, it excites me. We are setting an example for future generations and are demonstrating the power behind listening, the power behind history, the power behind truth. So that said, in collaboration with the UA School District, the UA Historical Society, and many other valuable organizations around town, the city of Upper Arlington is grateful to the panelists who are here with us this morning. And I am honored to introduce our facilitator for this discussion, Matt Boaz, Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion of UA Schools. Matt. Thank you, JP. I really appreciate that. Again, you know, I'm the new Executive Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Upper Arlington School District. I have the esteemed honor of introducing you to our panelists this morning and to also share a little bit about why uh, the Pleasant Litchford story and how we honor his legacy going forward is important to me. So I'll start with the introductions. Uh, first panelist is Steve Shoney, the Upper Arlington City Manager. The Morning. next one is Keith Pomeroy, Chief Academic Officer for Upper Arlington Schools. Good morning. Ms. Toya Williams, descendant of Pleasant Litchford. Ms. Diana Kelly Runyon, owner and principal of Lineage Links, a genealogical and historical research firm, and also the co-author of Secrets Under the Parking Lot. Good morning. And then last and certainly not least, we have Kim Shoemaker Starr, preservationist and co-author of Secrets Under the Parking Lot, and also a class of 1973 Upper Arlington graduate and a current Upper Arlington resident. Good Thank morning, you all everybody. for being here this morning. I'm sorry, Kim. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, I want to just uh, get right into the questions because we have a limited amount of time this morning, but we have a lot of information we want to share. Um, I will start off with uh, my own uh, reason for why this is important. Um, as I grew up in K through 12 education, uh, much of the educational process was void of uh, any real um, deep dive into any kind of black history. Um, as I went through and matriculated, um, there was also a lack of representation in terms of people who look like me sharing uh, curriculum and teaching and guiding the school district. As I got into college, I, I made a discovery that there was so much more information. Uh, more information than what I was learning in the classroom, uh, more availability of information outside of the classroom. And through that discovery, I got energized to learn more and more, not only about myself, but my ancestors. Um, I started going to the library on my own and doing research much like uh, Kim and Diane did when they discovered the information that led to the writing of Secrets Under the Parking Lot. The importance of education can never truly be measured. It's a, a passport to so many other things in life. Um, when I travel, I cherish the ability to be able to communicate with people. Um, and some of that communication skill started with the educational process. I cherish the ability um, to understand history through the educational process of learning over time. But one thing that I will say about education that has been disappointing is not learning more about people who look like me. Um, it's very important to understand that the history 
of treatment of Africans and their legacy has been much missed in our educational process. Um, as an example, when people went to Africa to get slaves for the transatlantic slave trade, um, they didn't go and, and capture slaves. They captured kings and queens and prince and princesses, doctors, lawyers, teachers, preachers, people who were minding and tending to their business, farmers farming the family land, people who had good lives. Through seasoning and assimilation, much of that history was lost, much like Pleasant Litchford's. It's so important that we take all of those things that have been erased, the positive attributes of those people and their lives, and particularly Pleasant Litchford's because of his connection to what is now known as Upper Arlington. It's so important for us to cherish that legacy, to honor that legacy, to really uplift his memory and the things that he did. Mr. Litchford, rose from you know being an enslaved person to a point of prominence through getting a skilled trade understanding how important that trade was and then sharing those gifts with his community but also leveraging that position to be able to uplift his family and the members of his community he started a school to get kids educated we talked about the importance of education and he understood that obviously. He also had a legacy of sharing with his community and dedicating pieces of his land for different important things in our community. And it's important that we honor that legacy. That is one of the reasons why it was so important for me to be part of this panel and to, to make sure that going forward that Upper Arlington as a community and more important and, and specific to me, Upper Arlington schools honor that legacy appropriately. And with that, I would like to dive into the question. Steve, I'm gonna start with you. Um, while you are new to your role as the city manager of Upper Arlington, you've been a resident of Upper Arlington for some time. What do you feel is the significance of Pleasant Litchford's story uh, to present day Upper Arlington and future Upper Arlington? Uh, Matt, thanks for the question. And thanks for being here. And, and I'm so excited to have you on the team. I don't, I can't remember whether in, in the introductions you mentioned that you haven't been here for a super long time with the schools. Um, but I learned a lot from what you just said. And one of the things I also learned was I never want to follow you again um, on a panel like this because um, that was, uh, that was a great kickoff. You know, for, um, for me, so I've lived here with my wife and my boys for pushing 15 years now. Um, and both as a parent and as a leader in the community, I look at history as doing two things. One is, is it can teach us lessons and two is it can inspire. And so typically we look at inspiration um, in history and we have looked at inspiration in history as um, kind of the, this great man theory, right? Um, where it's, you know, what, what great things have been done, what great accomplishments have been done. And we've done it in a very narrow context. I can't think of a more inspirational story in Upper Arlington than the Pleasant Litchford story. Um, when you look at what Mr. Litchford and his family overcame and then became and created, um, it's a legacy that obviously extends beyond Upper Arlington and in some ways um, moved well beyond Upper Arlington uh, because that's where it needed to move to become as great as it could be. So, you know, I, both as a parent and, and a leader and just a, a member of the community, I look at it and when you look for inspiration of, you know, what great things can be done and what can be overcome, which right now we, we need inspiration for how to overcome things. Um, it's hard to imagine. I can't think of another local story that speaks more to that power of overcoming. And and Steve, before you know, we move on to anyone else. I really just wanted to ask, how is the city commemorating and carrying on the story and legacy of Pleasant Litchford into per perpetuity? You know, uh, we don't know yet. 
Um, and I'll be honest with you, um, too often folks who look like me tell um, men and women of color and women in general um, what they should want and what they should do. Mm -hmm. um, we're not gonna do that in this case. We're gonna sit back and we're gonna listen. Um, you know, the schools, um, I'll, I'll give uh, Superintendent Imhoff a ton of credit. Paul has been on this and passionate and doing what leaders do, which is um, listening and problem solving. And that's what we're gonna do too. We're gonna sit back, we're gonna listen, we're gonna understand, and then we're gonna problem solve. So I don't know what it's gonna look like. Um, we're gonna take uh, a lot of guidance from uh, Toya and the other members of the family and, and really listen. Um, and then we'll problem solve. So uh, that's the best I can tell you at this point. Great, thank you. Keith, I want to move on to you. I, I would really like to know, why do you think it's important for the community to learn about the story of Pleasant Litchford and for it to be incorporated into the curriculum? Well, thank you for the question, Matt. And I want to start, I uh, follow Steve up. You guys are going to make this difficult. You know, everyone's uh, following these things. I want to start by saying I cannot echo Steve's sentiments more. Um, what a critical time frame! I am incredibly thankful, number one, to work for someone like Dr. Imhoff, um, who is taking this on, and uh, to Kim and Diane for bringing this story forward at the point where we did. You'll hear me speak in a moment about, um, you know, with all this happening in our district, there was potential that this story could have been lost to history. Um, completely in terms of the construction projects that are going on and without Kim and Diane's work um, to, you know, make sure that they bring it forward. And without Dr. Imhoff and Steve Shoney feeling willing to listen and take action, I think um, we could be in a different place. Okay, so now I'm gonna get to curriculum. So uh, Matt, I'm gonna share a screen really quickly and I wanted to maximize my time because anyone who knows me knows that containing me to seven to nine minutes is incredibly difficult. So. Uh, I think that it was important that I um, organize my thoughts and share them. I want to start um, with Amanda Gorman, because I think that her, her uh, poem at the inauguration is incredibly relevant in these times and incredibly relevant to this story. So um, I'm going to start with Amanda and end with Amanda in my presentation. So it is because being an American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the, it's the past we step into and how we repair it. And I think it's incredibly important to pay attention to those words, right? So as we look at this story and we look at the opportunity that we have, I think it is significant that we sit at, at this moment in time. And at this moment in time, we were able to have this story come forward in a way that it hadn't been, for, been before. You know, Pleasant was a name that people knew. But this was brought forward in a different way in this moment. And we are able to take action now and look at this history and consider what we do moving forward. So for me, I'm going to, the journey of a thousand steps from a curriculum perspective starts, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So I'm going to speak a little bit about third grade history as our starting point, right? This is only our starting point, And we believe that there's a lot to expand to from this point. But if I look at the third grade social studies standards, you're gonna see that there's a focus on communities past and present, near and far. So this is where we have really narrowed in early on. And if you look at that, there's a focus on how communities have changed over time and how artifacts and documents um, can bring that alive along the way. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about what that looks like. So I need to tell you up front that um, there is a group of people and I'll, I'll give you all those names at the end who we came together for about 18 months to look at a timeline. Um, and we as a group took the information in the book and additional information that we uh, knew. And we spent a long time contemplating what this timeline would be because we knew that that was a starting point that it agreed up, up, an agreed upon timeline is where we could start with our teachers. So as we meet with our third grade teachers now, oh, and I was supposed to change out an image here. So that's a timeline in the middle, just so you know, those are dots. Just, just to clarify. <laughs> um, so um, we are going to focus with our teachers on biographies, a timeline, 
and then maps. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. What has typically happened in UA is we have focused on our history from 1918 to today, right? So in those biographies, you would have heard about um, Henry and James Miller. You would have heard about Ben and King Thompson. You would have heard names in the biographies like that. What we're going to do is expand that. Um, we are going to look at this land when it was Perry Township and prior to even being Perry Township. So when we talk about biographies, we're going to add names to that. So we're going to add names like Elijah Bacchus. You're going to hear us talk about Pleasant Litchford. You're going to hear us talk about the Sells brothers. You're going to hear us talk about Bill Moose. And we're going to paint a broader picture of this area. And we as a committee and as a curriculum department um, feel that it's critically important that we put Central Ohio, Perry Township, and what eventually becomes UA in a broader context and look at the important contributions that come from this area. That really tells the story of change over time. So what I'm gonna do is just dial in very quickly on some maps because when we talk about bringing it to life, these plat maps that we have access to that are in the UA archives tell some really interesting stories that we think it's important to pay attention to. If I could just have two more hours, I would walk you through everything I want on this map, but Matt is not gonna give me two more hours. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through some features that I think are critically important. So when we look at the 1856 map, what you're going to find is certain features that I'm going to pay attention to. That is Lane Avenue, following very much the same trajectory you would see if you drove that today. And as you move further north, you're going to find a three-point um, connection in the roads that sits where the city building is and the OSU golf course. And that's, you know, Steve's there right now. Um, so it sits right in that space. As we continue to move forward, and I'm gonna go through these maps pretty quickly. When we look at 1872, we're gonna see certain features, but we've added a new one. You're gonna see a road that is running right through what is the center of Pleasant Litchford's property. And that road um, will not change as we move forward through the rest of these maps. Lane Avenue looks exactly the same, and where Steve Shoney sits today is still the same. <laughs> so if we look at 1883, you'll find the same thing. And we look at certain features, we still have what is Ridgeview Road today, following that exact same trajectory, that same three point connection, and then you're going to see Lane Avenue. What you also notice in this map, just because it's a wider view of it is, you're seeing a road that dead ends into uh, Ridgeview Road, which is Pleasant's property. Um, in this map, you can also see Pleasant's property has been divided up. Pleasant passed away in 1879. This is an 1883 map. But that road moving north into that land is North Star Road, right? So if you're looking at North Star, um, that is what you're going to see. And as we move forward again, 1910, same things. You're going to see Lane Avenue looks the same. Three point uh, intersection still the same. What is now Ridgeview Road still looks exactly the same as we move forward to 1940. Now what you can see is from 1910 to 1940, you have the purchase of the land that starts to become Upper Arlington. And you can see quite a few changes in here. Um, but what you still see is that same trajectory of that same road. I often now, I have taken to, when I leave the high school and if I'm driving to any other location, I tend to drive across Ridgeview all the way to Tremont before I leave because I find something incredibly amazing about the fact that 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 trajectory hasn't changed since 1872 in these maps. Um, you're still going to see Lane Avenue. And then if you go further north, you're going to see that three point connection. And as we look at 2020, I guess as we work through this, I think it's important to notice what's there and what's not, because the legacy of those who were in this space before us, it's not just what you see in the maps, it's also what you don't see in the maps when you move forward. So as we move forward, what we're going to find is Lane Avenue, named Lane Avenue. And as you, if we looked closer at those maps, you would have seen the name Lane just south of Lane Avenue on all of those maps. So as we keep moving forward, you're going to see the same three-point intersection, Ridgeview Road. And as we go further north, you're going to see names like Lane, Reed, uh, Kenny. I'm going to just build all these out. Oh, I'll go back one. So you're going to see multiple names that you know. And those names are on roads, you see that. The other question is, again, there are names that you know that are not on this map now. So as you look at it, what's there, what's not? And as we look at this space and change over time, when we look at 1856 and look at the roads that were here, 
very few roads. If you look at 1872, now you've added in what is what becomes Ridgeview. And you can see this is very much uh, country, right? It's not, a, it's not a suburb, it's not anything, it's all country, not as many roads. So it's building over time. And then when you hit 1940, you can see that growth and that change. So when we look at 2020, obviously built out completely. What's the important um, connection to that in terms of change over time? Local history helps students better understand their community as well as the inequities they see around them. So as we look at um, what we see today, it's important for us to reclaim that local history. When we tell the 1918 to today version of our history, you're only hearing a small portion of that history. And the questions we need to ask ourselves is who's writing that history, right? So who writes that history? History is often, often written by the victors or the oppressors, right? So as we look at that history, what is missing? And you'll hear things when you talk about reclaiming local history, like racism is no longer, no longer lived in that space. Um, so there was no need to bring up the past, but the remnants of that past remain in fact, still with people all the way through. When we look at dates that are important in Upper Arlington, 1971 is an important date. Because when you look at 1971 as a year, it's a year where you have lawsuits that change what can happen within the space. So restrictive approaches um, start to change after that time frame. but it's important that we pay attention to all of those things. And this from this same article, and if I go back one, it's a great article from Cassandra Dillard, um, and, which is, um, if you look for recovering and teaching local history, and we could put a link out to that when we have everything done. Um, they talk about the story is buried figuratively and literally all over the country. Reclaiming local history all over the country is necessary to tell the story of those people who their story hasn't been shared. So our question has to be as a district, how can we capture those voices? How can we bring, um, we had thought in the past we needed to work with the descendant community in order to understand this. And the amazing thing we have now is that we have actual descendants of Pleasant Litchford involved in this conversation. So to have Toya here today and to have her family involved in this is amazing so that we can capture the voices to talk about how we expand this history. We need to tell much broader history. And as we look at passing our centennial in 2018, if we really want to cherish the past, right? and build that golden future, then what that means is we need to tell a more complete history of this area, of the importance of the people who were in this land and in this space prior to us. And in order to expand that history beyond 1918 to 2018. So I wanna share a little snippet. This is a short, minute, just over a minute clip. Um, Kim Shoemaker Starr has been working with a student, Natalie at the high school and um, Natalie has been exploring this um, story for um, quite some time and digging into it. And I think this short bit of, uh, of her video that she's put together really captures thinking around what it means to inherit this space and this land. So I'm gonna. My next question is, do you think that it's important to tell the history of indigenous groups and different ethnic groups that lived in the area before Ben and King Thompson? And if so, how should they be honored, respected, or remembered? Yes, that's a great question. Um, this is not a history, um, so whose land are we on? Mm -hmm. um, because like, indigenous folks. Like, yeah. we do not is that coming through loud enough, by the way? Okay, I'm gonna stop share, restart share. I'll fix that really quick. That is my fault. Let me redo the share. My apologies. Share sound, get it right. And then my next question is, do you think that it's important to tell the history of indigenous groups and different ethnic groups that lived in the area before Ben and King Thompson? And if so, how should they be honored, respected, or remembered? Yes, that's a great question. Um, it's very important, right? Because, like, this is not our land, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, whose land are we on? Mm -hmm. um, because, like, the ownership of land is such a forward idea, especially to, like, indigenous folks. Like, yeah. we do not. 
not own this. Yeah. We we live here and then leave it with our children. Mm -hmm. It is not ours, right? Yeah. And so sometimes I search up like whose land am I in? Because mm -hmm. it literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love for it to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. I. Um, would love to see a space in the new building and mm -hmm. school because we have like an alumni space, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what if we had like an indigenous people space? Like yes. what land are we on? Yes. Could we talk with those mm -hmm. tribes? We were not the first people to inhabit this land and we will not be the last. We must carry on the legacy of those who came before us in spite of their misfortunes and the injustice against them. History is a vital piece in understanding who we are. The first step in healing from the past is to learn about and honor the people who made this place their home, just as we do today. And as their stories faintly echo through our lives, we must carry on the torch of their legacy. Julie, oh Julie, won't you run? Cause I see down yonder the soldiers... Okay, so as we capture that, Natalie Harrison, who's done that work at the high school, I think it's one of the things that we contemplated quite a bit as a timeline committee as well is what are the additional opportunities? I've talked a little bit about third grade, but we believe there are significant opportunities for our students to be involved in uncovering this rich history and digging deeper into this work. Um, and I think it's critically important. So the last, uh, the last little piece that I want to share here is one of the things that we think long term, if we come to a point where when we're talking about Pleasant, we're talking about him in this way. Um, and if these accomplishments, if these accomplishments are, are primary, right, that he was a prominent blacksmith, member and deacon of the Second Baptist Church, abolitionist and champion for education, who migrated from Virginia to Ohio around 1830, despite barriers like the black law bonds, um, which put multiple barriers in place, someone paying money and guaranteeing that you won't cause trouble, those types of things being put in his way, that he was able to become a prominent figure and purchase 227 acres. And by the way, he was also a former slave who was able to buy his family out of slavery. That is not a small accomplishment at all, but we often start in the opposite direction and we start with the fact that he was enslaved prior to and his accomplishments speak for themselves and it's a story that we need to uncover and we need to reference the barriers that he had to overcome in the process so i leave you with we've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice and i think amanda gorman summed it up well um, our goal is to start to tell this story in a broader perspective and expand the opportunities for our children to really understand this. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank all of these people on the timeline committee who helped us work to get this timeline together for our teachers. They were amazing. Um, we will eventually get to have a reunion when we can get to be in one space together um, and be together again now that we're getting shots in arms. But thank you, Matt. Um, sorry, I took that long. No, thank you, Keith. I uh, really appreciate the education that was offered to me just there and, and uh, really appreciate your contribution. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the importance and honor of having uh, Miss Toya Williams with us, a Pleasant Litchford descendant. And Toya, I'd like to turn to you now and just ask you, can you tell us how you're related to Pleasant Litchford and, you know, tell us a little bit about your family. I will be happy to. I wanna first thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to be involved in this panel today to discuss um, my ancestor, one of the first settlers of Perry Township, Pleasant Litchford. For this presentation, I might refer to him as my grandfather because in essence, that's who he is. Um, it means everything to be here, and I would love to share that with you. Catherine has a slide that just shows my family tree, and if she could put that up for us, that would be great. Is it sharing? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Technology. Um, I am related to Pleasant Litchford on my father's side of the family. It's my grandmother, Laura Walker, 
who was the granddaughter of Rachel Litchford, who was the granddaughter of Pleasant Litchford. So that would make Pleasant Litchford my great, 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 great grandfather on my grandmother's side, my father's birth mother. Um, I didn't find out until a few years ago that I was related to Pleasant Litchford because of some hardships that my father suffered when he was born. His mother, Laura, died 24 hours after birth of a postpartum ambulance. So he went to live with his father's side of the family, the Hollemans. Uh, and so with that being said, he was you know, raised by his grandmother on his father's side, his father and his stepmother. Uh, we knew of the Walkers, we knew of the Litchfords, but never had any interactions or were able to meet them. We did uh, have some cousins that we knew uh, in the 70s, another descendant of Pleasant Litchford, which I'm in search of today, also a daughter of Rachel, um, who we're trying to find, you know, their descendants as well. But being related to Pleasant Litchford has opened my eyes to so many things. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, how did you feel when you learned that you were related to Pleasant and, and you know, in this connection, you know, what are, can you tell us about some of the, the joys of being able to reconnect with the people you have reconnected with? Of course, um, being related to Ple Pleasant means everything. It means everything, you know, because of him being a man of family, faith, and education, a man who overcame hardships. He was born into a difficult situation, but he was able to get himself out of that situation. Just means I come from good stock. And it just means everything to me because when I look at like my dad's history, he came, you know, he overcame his hardships because he had a hard life. My dad did, unfortunately, you know, suffered at the hands of abusers or whatever. And so it just means we're fighters. We're determined, you know, and it, it really helps me know that I'm not the only one because I am, you know, very much one for helping my community and helping fellow man. What I love about Pleasant Litchford is he was someone who paid it forward before that term was even fashionable. You know, he was born into a difficult situation, but he died a free man. I mean, how could you not find joy in the fact that you know, a man of color set roots in what is one of the uh, most prominent suburbs in Franklin County today. I'm sure when he came here, he didn't think, hey, I'm going to go to Ohio and do some things. He just wanted to make a better way for himself and his family and his community. And he did that. And almost 200 years later, we're still discussing him because it's very important. Unfortunately, some of the injustices, these injustices haven't changed or people of color. You know, I can still go in a store and be followed by a security guard because I'm a woman of color. These things still happen, you know? And the fact that he was able to not get caught up in the negative side of things, that he was just very much in the positive side of things, like working along people like James Preston Poindexter for change, for the anti-slavery movement. You know, I'm a descendant of both the Litchford and the Depp, so both sides of my family, they were for the, you know, helping the Underground Railroad. They were just for helping people. And it just makes me know where I get it from because I've always had a passion for helping others. And it just means everything to me. Thank you so much, Toya. And I want to personally thank you uh, for, thank you to you and your family for sharing Pleasant with us. Um, it would be easy for the family to just close ranks say, you know what, we're not going to allow this to happen. We're yeah. going to keep them to ourselves. But sharing him with us it is really, truly um, helpful in so many ways. And we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. And we appreciate all of you. And I do want to give a personal thanks to everyone here today, but especially Diane Runyon and Kim Shoemaker Star. It's very important that you all know they brought the story forward. And without them, I don't think we'd be here today. We really wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you go get the book, mm -hmm. contact Kim and get the book and read it and under, you know, and learn about local history because it doesn't just talk about Pleasant. It just talks about our history. It's all of our history now. Mm -hmm. and we need to embrace it. 
how are we going to learn from our mistakes if we don't look at the past and go forward? So I just want to thank everyone here. You know, I was thinking after watching everyone's presentation, it's going to be very hard for me <laughs> to go forward because Keith, I loved it. I loved everything that's been said here today. And I want to thank you all. Thank you, Toya. And I, I think I'll take a cue from you and uh, I'll ask Diane a question now, <laughs> if she's ready. Diane, you yes. and Tim have yourself become part of the history of Upper Arlington through the impact of your research and your book, Secrets Under the Parking Lot. I'll give that a plug really quick. Um, you both have enabled Upper Arlington to honor a, a more complete history. How do you feel like reclaiming of the story of Pleasant Litchford will impact Upper Arlington as we move forward into the future? Well, thank you so much for letting me address this. Kim and I have not had an easy way in the first five years of the release of our book had a lot of unhappy people in UA because we were chattering their belief in what they felt their opinion of UA was. They didn't know about the past. And so now that we have this going on with all the people here that have been helping us get the story out and showing that there were many different types of people of many different ethnicities that had an important part of the basis of UA. And it didn't really just start in 1918. So when we started our new research, it was like there hadn't been almost nothing about Pleasant Lishford, a few things here and there mentioned, but nothing. And we worked tirelessly for a year and a half. Now, so people know that research is still going on. And we're still working with the Library of Virginia uh, trying to find his manumission papers and those things, but that is very, very difficult to do. But we have found the manumission papers of uh, the Depp family. And people have asked, how did Pleasant Litchford get money to come here? Well, he was, we believe, and had many times, he was very talented as a blacksmith and he most likely was hired out of the plantation to earn some kind of funds. Now the Depp family inherited quite a bit of money when they when their master passed, and he um, they had a fair amount of money coming to Ohio. So um, Pleasant was a very resourceful person. He didn't come here with uh, zero funds. He worked on the state house, and uh, he was able to get um, the land through through his hard work. But um, so, so that you know that for Upper Arlington and for us, the biggest validation was finding remains at the cemetery for the archeology span excavation. When you have done all that work and have put your, your name on the line saying, there are people buried here and you're getting a lot of pushback and when they were finally found, which was a bittersweet situation, we knew we were right in the beginning and it validated our research. And so that was very important. So it finding those remains was very impactful to the community because now they had to, it was a tangible item that they are looking at saying this really did happen. This wasn't just a story, which history is a story. It's like. When I taught history, I always told my students, it's like a soap opera from the Romans all the way to here. It's always violent, it's unfair, people are hurt. It's just, it's never pretty flowers. It's always a struggle. From the beginning of time, history has been a struggle for one ethnicity or another. What's nice about what we found out, and I'm going to shout out to Neil Bryant and his wonderful wife, who are probably hopefully watching us in California this morning. He was my first contact. And, and that opened up wonderful family members. And we're still finding family members. We just found James and Tia and Toya just within the last year. We have Dr. Simmons, uh, he was he was a former neurosurgeon in California. He's retired. He's part of the Litchford family also and lives in California. So when we found that um, 
Neil Bryant's DNA from the African American DNA by um, Dr. Kittles. He came from the Tikar tribe. Now, the Tikar tribe was very a uh, scholarly tribe. They were not warriors. They were um, big into uh, ironworks and things like that. Very resourceful. So they were kind of easy to take in a way because they were not warriors. They were scholars and and doers. And so if you're going to bring somebody to a new land, you want the scholars and the doers. And uh, so they were resourceful from way back then, and that's in their DNA. I think that at the point where Paul Emmel, who I have to give incredible thanks to, and um, to see that this story had so many legs and had so much impact for the community itself, because it's not what the community believed they were. And now here's the whole picture, which is very rich and very impactful for all people of, of all ethnicities to know that your voice can be heard. And I think that going forward that this is going to make a big difference in education. Since I'm an educator, um, you know, all K-12, because if you don't teach history, you are ignorant to the past and it's never pretty, but it has to be told. And thank you so much for having Kim and I on here. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of Kim, I'm gonna move toward Kim. Kim, it's my understanding that you have this, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but you have a habit of going to cemeteries and, and working on them and cleaning them up and restoring them to a, a respectable place. Why do you feel that caring for cemeteries and the stories of those who came before us is critical to who we are now and where we're going in the future? Well, I'm, I'm so blessed to be here and all of you are amazing. All the panelists and the, Paul Emmenhoff and Keith Pomeroy, you have just ha helped us so much in making this story real again that was covered up for so many years. And we're so blessed to have you <clears throat> on our side, <laughs> working together. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about cemeteries. I guess that maybe that will help out and um, people to understand. Um, in the 19th century, uh, cemeteries were used, people would have picnics there and they were beautiful and they were, you know, surreal and it was a place to honor and be around your family and that's how it was in the 19th century. In the 20th century, people were afraid, um, you know, you have movies and you have plays going on with ghosts and goblins and all these horrible things, so people became afraid of cemeteries. And then now in the 20, 21st century, it's kind of, it's gone back to understanding about cemeteries, the love and the importance of how, keeping our cemeteries clean and restored and honoring the people from that came back before. Um, in Philadelphia, they're having yoga classes in cemeteries. Um, in Michigan, they're having fishing contests in the ponds that are in the cemeteries. And our, the first parks around ever were cemeteries. That was the first parks. Mm -hmm. And out the park uh, cemeteries are, are outside museums with ponds and flowers and, and it's just amazing how it's changed. Well, cemeteries uh, bring families together and they offer us insight into local history and a cemetery has a deep historical connection to our community. They also bring residents closer to an understanding of the past and help us to provide history of the people who lived in the area before us. And we have to see our cemeteries as a very important part of our city as it speaks to the past and links us to the present and the future. We cannot ignore our past. We don't wanna ignore our past. History is history. We have to honor and learn who all of our pioneers were everyone's lives mattered and respect and the dignity and the love for each person. So we have to teach this to our children and to our community to respect our cemeteries, to um, 
even not doing um, rubbings. I'm sure you've heard about doing rubbings on cemetery headstones, but it takes away some of the little pieces of sand that are in the old, old headstones. So we don't want that. And like um, kids that think it's so funny to be climbing on the headstones, we have to teach that that's not what you do. Those people's lives mattered. So that takes us into Pleasant Litchford and finding this information that we have found, Diane and I have worked so hard at, and then not giving up. This was given to us because we are strong. Diane and I are strong women. We're not going to keep being um, uh, a bridge being put up in front of us and we back off. We kept fighting through it because we knew we believed the history, even if we had not found any bodies at the cemetery at the high school, that the story had to be told. These people had to be honored. They had to be recognized and appreciated for who they were, what they have struggled and gone through. This is our history. What an honor to be involved with such a great man and family. It's it's been a, such a joy, and with um, Paul Emenhoff and the Board of Education as the city wanting to make the area where the cemetery is at the high school memorial uh, park a little uh, place to be able to honor and have respect and and have tranquil sitting set uh, setting area is an amazing accomplishment we're so blessed to have this go on so i appreciate it and please uh, teach your children to respect cemeteries but to not be afraid thank you so thank you thank you kim really appreciate that you know, as I sat and listened to this, I thought back to a time in my life where in my home county, I, I'm from a rural county in Northwest Ohio, and there was a connection where former enslaved people uh, were brought to uh, the land where I grew up and back in the 1800s. And what happened was the slave owner on this big plantation bought a piece of land for his slaves to be freed and live in the northern states. There was a cemetery there because one of the biggest pieces of segregation in our past is where we're buried. So there was a cemetery there for Black descendants. I used to go to this cemetery shortly after I got my driver's license. And it was just a place where I felt some sense of belonging in a way that I didn't always feel in that county that had a percentage of uh, population was 99.7% Caucasian. But I used to go to the cemetery for peace. But the one thing I always noticed about that cemetery is I had to clean it up. I had to like clear off things and you couldn't read some of the stones. And it clearly was not kept the way Kim is talking about with honor and dignity. So as I sat through this panel, I thought about that cemetery and I thought about those people and I thought about the pieces of their legacy that was lost. It is so important that we pay attention to these things. And it's so important that we use that as a catalyst to pay attention to what goes on in our society. We will watch the news and we're so desensitized to these things that we'll watch news coverage about the process for figuring out where to put a stadium and not make the connection that in the process of creating an entertainment venue, we're displacing people that are disproportionately large percentages, people of color. We are creating history in that process that other people will study later in this way. And that's how we change things, is to understand how our history is driving what happens today and what we can do about what is going on today to alter that history so that our descendants are studying something different. It's really important in times like this that we understand that. I want to thank all of the panelists for so much information today and how much I've learned and how much so many other people have had an opportunity to learn. But I also have one more person I want to introduce. Um, we have one more person here and 
this is the American composer, Dr. Richard Jordan Smoot, whose orchestral piece called Golden Honors Pleasant Litchford. Richard, in an article published by WOSU in May of 2018, you said, I wanted to create something that had this kind of majestic, positive, forward moving spirit. But at the same time, I wanted to pay tribute to this very important person who had settled in what would become the heart of Upper Arlington. And that person is Pleasant Litchford. Can you tell us about yourself and about the piece that you composed? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Richard Smoot. I'm a uh, composer, as uh, Matt just said. Um, I am not a native of Upper Arlington, uh, but I've been here quite a while. I originally grew up on the East Coast in Connecticut in a factory town along the Pusatonic River. Um, there was one black student at my school and we were not a wealthy community in there, but we had a large black community around us. And I learned at an early age that the word racism certainly applied to all the things we'd heard from the South, including my stepfather who was from Lynchburg, but there was a lot of racism in the North. Um, I came to Ohio in 1970 and uh, in 1995 bought a house in Upper Arlington. Um, at that time, I did not know that I am one block South of what was Litchford Road. And uh, I did not know that until relatively recently, and, and I'll, I'll get into that. But I have had two children go to the UA schools. They've had wonderful experiences. My youngest is, uh, my oldest is 40, and my youngest is about to turn 24, and was also active in the orchestra and the music program. In fact, they're both involved with music. Um, the, I also mentioned I was a music professor for a long time, uh, and I, um, now I am a composer and teacher, and I own a studio here in Columbus, and I have owned this studio since the early 90s when I left academia. Um, the, basically, I was probably on the radar with uh, some of the people in the music program here. I've taught, taught a lot of the kids privately over the years. Um, and in 2017, in December of 2017, I was approached by um, Ed and Gretchen Zunick and the Upper Arlington Orchestra Parents Association to create a work for the centennial, the uh, centennial of the 2018 founding of Upper Arlington. Now, Ed Zunick uh, came to see me at my studio, which, which I'm in right now, and um, asked if it would be, it told me about the commission and see if I was interested. And I was, um, and then he brought up the subject of this book right here. That would be the book by Kim and Diane. Um, and by the way, buy it from them, not Emma. That was a joke. Uh, anyway, um, the, he asked me if I would look into the book and he introduced to me, based on his own research and his and Gretchen's, and obviously very many other people that I, I didn't even know this was going on, the story of Pleasant Litchford. Now, my music is begins with my early earliest music making on the East Coast and then out here. It was pop, it was rock, it was blues, it was jazz, it wasn't classical. I got into classical music by via the classical guitar, studying classical composition, and then I just just didn't want to get a day job. Um, but the uh, important thing is there was a lot of this roots music in, in my thinking and, and there always has been. So when they asked me to write some, some, something that would also include a tribute to Pleasant Litchford and somehow create a sense of his story, my first reaction is, do you want a white guy to do this? And then I thought about it and I said, sure because it's the white community that needs to respond to this story because it's the white community that caused this story to go underground. And so the next step was to start, start uh, sketching and, and things like that. 
And I decided that there would be three areas of focus because this was indeed a work to honor a community I'd come to love. I mean, this is 2017 and I've been here since 1995. And uh, that was for the centennial and everything that the centennial meant to me as a resident and many and many of my friends uh, in this community. And it also was an opportunity to celebrate this wonderful high school orchestra. I mean, the Upper Arlington High School music program is extraordinary. The middle school program is extraordinary. The elementary school program, extraordinary. My kids have gone through them. The orchestra, I've had the pleasure of writing about 12 orchestra pieces. I've had the pro musica play at Columbus Symphony. I've had concerts in Europe. Uh, I'm bragging, I don't mean to, because when I, when I tell you that this orchestra was as good as anything I've heard, they were playing at a professional level when they played my music. And this was a second piece I had them do of mine. So it was a great honor to do this and I wanted to honor them. Um, I also learned that I could pick some soloists. And so really it led very logically to the next phase, which was how was I going to honor Pleasant Richard? And, and I read, by the time I got to really getting into the writing of the piece, I had read the book and I had been just blown away by what uh, Diane and Kim had done. Um, it was interesting to me on a side note that they were both in the DAR. My mother was a member of the DAR, very proud member of the DAR, but my older brother and me and my, my, and my younger brother always joked about if you're in the DAR, that's like the ultimate white group, okay? And, and, you know, and, and we would suggest, you know, maybe too much. Well, guess what? We were wrong because here are people who are more concerned about the history of this country doing this work and bringing forth the truth than anything else. And uh, so that, that, I thought that was pretty cool. So the three areas of focus, honoring the centennial, celebrating the kids in the orchestra and the music teachers, and then honoring Pleasant Litchford. And somebody might say, okay, so you chose the blues. And I said, yeah, I chose the blues as a guy who has inherited the blues by a rock, direct investigation of the blues, all kinds of uh, music, jazz, it's everywhere. And who do we owe this to? Well, we owe it to the suffering of slaves in this country who invented and brought us the blues. And so when you see people out there and you say, hey, that's nice and bluesy, well, guess what? They inherited it and they have interpreted it. But if we go to the roots, if we go to Lead Belly, Robert Johnson, Elizabeth Cotton, so many artists and the artists have come from that. We're talking about something where out of all of this horrible, horrific suffering, we can't hide from the truth of that, came this powerful music that came to teach people about that suffering. So I'm gonna to try to speed this up a little because I know the time is essential. When I wrote this, I wrote an opening majestic golden thing theme, you'll hear it at the outset. Then at about, I'm gonna say, about three minutes into the piece, you're gonna hear some blues start. And you're gonna hear three very fine soloists from the orchestra of that time. One of them happened to be the harpist, uh, Susan Zunick, who was Ed and Gretchen's daughter, who's now off at Baldwin Wallace studying music. Um, uh, so you'll hear cello, violin, and harp. And at this point, I was trying to play a little game of fantasy myself and with my listeners. I wanted people to imagine that Pleasant Litchford was in the room, in their space, and they were conversing with him. And the listener or the composer would be telling the story and hearing the story. And in this, there can be nothing but sadness and some melancholy at the fact that so much of the story has been erased. The melody I want you to listen for, it's the blues melody in the middle. So you'll hear something along that line and then it goes on for a while. And then when you get to about 
oh, seven minutes to nine minutes, we start moving into the close of the piece. And the golden theme comes back, but this time it's with the pleasant Litchford blues. And I'm very uh, happy to say that the very last two measures, Pleasant gets to have the last word. The title golden to me was important and not because of money, but because to have a golden future means to have diversity. It means to have love. It means to have communion. It means to have all of the things I think we have in this community, but it also means to have the truth and the truth about our past. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, the tech person to offer you uh, golden. Thank you. And I know you use tech person loosely. Catherine. <laughs> oh no. Oh dear. It says to, okay. Sorry, momentary. Here we go. Please let me know if this does not. That's it.
That was absolutely beautiful. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yukami Awakison Jeter, and I serve as one of the members of Upper Arlington's uh, Community Relations Committee. I also had the very distinct honor um, of being on the planning committee that brought this event um, to you this morning. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, but before we wrap up, I'd like to take just a few minutes, uh, give some much due thanks, and offer an opportunity uh, to extend this discussion beyond uh, these sessions. But I'm gonna flip the script a little bit. Uh, I wanna thank all the panelists uh, and uh, facilitators never get asked the question, but Matt, I'm going to um, ask you a question uh, that was brought up kind of in our first panel and just seems like an ongoing curiosity from, from residents of Upper Arlington. We know you're new to your role and we're so excited to have you. Uh, the question is this, are there any plans as part of the new high school opening uh, to name or acknowledge the literate family's contributions in any way? And that's a question. That's a question, that's a question for you, Mr. Facilitator. So We're putting you in the hot seat on your new job. Per, per the family's request, we are planning to um, have a process for determining the best way to honor Mr. Litchford and his legacy. Uh, we will let the process um, drive much of, of what is um, decided and what is done in the future. But um, I think it will be a process that involves uh, people, you know, a wide range of constituents that can definitely um, look at all of the information and all of the history and try to figure out the best way to honor Mr. Litchford's legacy. I think where our concerns are that we don't want to, we don't want to do anything that would be disrespectful to the family. Um, we don't want to assume that a small group of people can contain the thoughts of a larger group of people. So we want to make sure there's a process to determine what how best to do this so that that's the best answer i can give you at this time um, dr m hoff is very supportive and i'm thankful to have him as a supervisor and mentor uh, but he's very supportive of being respectful to the family and 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 being in communication with the family to honor what they want more important than anything, but also to do it in a way that is sustainable into the future so that a hundred years from now, people aren't wondering what happened to the legacy of Pleasant Litchford. So. Thank you. Thanks hey, for you, can, you, can I just chime in on that? Yes, that? please. Um, you know, I, I, this gets back to something I said earlier. I, there in this discussion there's a desire to jump to solutions there's a desire to say we need to name this or we need to name that or we need to name the other thing and what matt just said about thinking that the small group can figure out what's right before we have the broader conversation is spot on and we do that too much um so i want to commend matt in the district for doing that and again i've said it before to commend toya and all of her um, uh, relatives that are are distant in many ways, but are learning how to come together um, for engaging in this with us. Because you know, uh, this needs to be when you talk about stakeholders, we need to define that broadly um, and really focus on those stakeholders that have a lot to say about it and should have a lot to say about it. So I want to thank Matt and uh, and the entire school administration, in particular, the superintendent for taking that kind of a measured approach to it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna close this uh, very much like Keith um, in his, his remarks to us today by leaning into a poet Amanda Gorman's um, inauguration poem, uh, The Hill We Climb. She also said this, um, for a while our eyes are on the future. History has its eyes on us. And it gives me great pride um, that what we have done today, history will look back at and say, 
we did the right thing. Um, I wanna thank our esteemed panelists today. I'm sure you'll all agree their perspectives, their candor have given us insights into the sediment history of Upper Arlington. And it reminds us, right, of the role that we play in preserving sacred truths, the complexity of history. Uh, so, so thank you, thank you to all of you. I also wanna thank you, Toyer, and the descendants of Pleasant Litchford that are in attendance this morning. Uh, thank you for hearing us and allowing us to honor your family's legacy. Toya, would you like to make a, a few final remarks? Yes, I would. Um, I want to thank Richard for that beautiful piece. I adore classical music, and I was just in heaven listening to every note of it. So thank you, Richard, for the beautiful way of honoring uh, my ancestor, Pleasant Litchford. I thank you very much. Bravo. And on behalf of Jim and myself and the rest of our family, we just want to take the time to thank each and every one of you for one, allowing us to participate in events like these and just recognizing Pleasant for Black History Month, but it goes beyond that, uh, recognizing Pleasant every day of the year. You know, Black History needs to be celebrated 365, not just one month out of the year. So in recognizing Pleasant for every day of the year, what you're doing with the schoolwork and what you're doing with the curriculum and what you're doing with uh, what we're trying to figure out what, what would be the best way to honor Pleasant. That means so much to us. So we appreciate each and every one of you for just taking the time to allowing us to participate, hearing our voices and respecting the family. Um, because like you said before, we could have shut it down, but we don't want to do that. We want future generations, not only in our family, but in the community to know what a great contribution to this area he made. So we just want to thank you and we appreciate you all. Thank you, Toya. Um, and, and, and I love what you said about Black history being American history, uh, because it, it really is. And these are conversations. So I'm, I'm grateful to see that uh, the schools and Keith, that they're all thinking about how we incorporate this into the curriculum. So it's an ongoing thing and not this big hoopla just in February. Um, you know, very much like you, Toy, I am Black 365 days a year, right? <laughs> and so and this is uh, American history, right? Uh, and, to, and to that end, I want to thank um, the ad hoc kind of committee that came together here and sprang into action, worked so tirelessly to make these events, the inaugural um, Upper Arlington's Black History Month happen. Uh, Michelle Montgomery, Mandy Markoff, Kim Peterson, Sayla Kramer, Marianne Mitchell, Nicholas Fortcamp, Lisa Wilson, JP Duvall, and Catherine, who has been amazing and doing the tech lead today for us. Um, you have all become just so dear friends and my personal uh, just heartfelt thanks. Thanks to each of you. Um, Kim and Diane, I know a lot has been said and I have to personally thank you for throwing all your resources tirelessly to illum illuminating the story, right? Um, because again, the, the past and what we do in making sure that we preserve that sacredness, and both of you recognizing that and barking up all sorts of trees despite our positions to illuminate the story I thank you. Um, thanks also goes out to the schools, the city, the historical society, the library, every civic group here in Upper Arlington um, that has been collaborating on this and, and just making this a citywide event. Finally, to all of you that are attending this morning, thank you, right? Your engagement, your curiosity, it brings vibrant color to the fabric of our community. It engulfs those who live here, who work here, who visit here, who have a sense of welcome and belonging, which again is the mission of why we have the Community Relations Committee, right? So thank you for engaging with us and for being part of us this morning, even on your 10 second commute to your computer. Thank you. Uh, this event may be finished, but, but it really doesn't stop here. I wanna offer you two ways, right? That you can kind of continue the engagement. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to pick up the book, 
um, that has been the premise of this series and that's Secret Under the Parking Lot. Uh, I believe Kim already kind of added the, the contact information in the chat. The beautiful thing about Kim being local is she will drop that right off at your front door, right? So that's great. Please go ahead and support the authors and the work that they put in here uh, and, and get a copy of that book. I'm also really excited uh, to, to, to tell you folks about um, the newly established endowment fund um, by Upper Arlington's Education Foundation. Um, that's a fund that will support diversity, equity, and inclusion in Upper Arlington schools. Of course, it's aptly titled the Pleasant Litchford Fund, right? Equal UA in partnership with the Pleasant Litchford descendants brought to fruition so that residents of UA um, can continue to enjoy the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools. Right? Residents of UA have already seeded the endowment fund. It will ensure that the work continues, uh, but you're, you're welcome to make a donation to that fund. That's another way for you to show your support for what we are doing. We'll drop a link for that in the chat as well. Uh, so, so you know how to do that. We will make this recording available. I kind of think up of um, mediums in which we continue this conversation, in which we keep you engaged. I know we've kind of had a lot of interest here, um, but we're still working through all the platforms and how we keep these stories going. And of course, like has already been echoed here with Steve and Matt, working very hand in hand with the descendants to make sure that we are doing this right. So it's not going to be a fast process or something that everyone suggests. We welcome your feedback, send all the feedback, and we will work collectively with the descendants to make sure that we continue these conversations. We have finished four minutes early, which is always nice to gain time back. I want to thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. <laughs>